And before that, here on BBC One, the main evening news with Michael Burke. Britain and America have pulled back from the brink of war after an Iraqi climb down when the bombers were on their way. President Clinton said he'll launch the strikes again if Saddam breaks his word. Baghdad celebrates. Iraqis are told they pulled a rug from under the West. Good evening. Britain and America said tonight that the threat of airstrikes will remain, even though Iraq has agreed unconditionally to allow UN weapons inspectors to do their jobs. President Clinton said the agreement would have to be tested on the ground before the threat would be lifted. A new war in the Middle East was only hours away yesterday. When Saddam Hussein backed down, American bombers were already on their way and British tornadoes had been given the go-ahead to attack. It was the night Iraq faced the most comprehensive military assault since the Gulf War. Stealth aircraft were readied as part of a major military task force of ships and planes which would have subjected Iraq to a cruise missile bombardment and sustained bombing. Britain and the United States say it could still happen. Iraq has backed down, but that is not enough. Now Iraq must live up to its obligations. Iraq has committed to unconditionally resume cooperation with the weapons inspectors. At the spearhead of the Allied Air Armada were America's giant B-52 bombers. Armed with cruise missiles, they took off from their home bases in the United States at 9.30 London time. At 10 o'clock, the Prime Minister authorised RAF tornadoes based in Kuwait to join the attack. He'd personally approved the targets. Four hours later, the tornadoes were stood down and the B-52 mission aborted. The US Defence Secretary says they were close, very close to launching missiles. Then at 22.49, 10 to 11 last night, the White House rejected Iraq's offer to cooperate with the United Nations as unacceptable. Iraq's letter had contained an appendix with nine conditions. Deeply distrustful of an Iraqi leader who has repeatedly broken his word, the United States and Britain told other members of the Security Council they would accept no qualification of the inspector's role. There were frantic consultations involving the UN Secretary General. Well, I think at least they've made a, a step in the right direction. And as I indicated the, this uh, month, this, uh, this morning, is a, a positive development, but the Council may want further clarifications. And Three more Iraqi letters followed swiftly. Iraq's ambassador at the United Nations said yes, there sir, were no I conditions. He promised uh, clear uh, and unconditional uh, cooperation with the United Nations. Uh, I think uh, what I uh, got that the majority of the council members do appreciate uh, Iraq's cooperation and uh, appreciate the Iraqi uh, flexibility on trying to find a way out of this crisis. Throughout the night, there were constant phone calls between Blair and Clinton. It was dawn in Washington before they decided how to respond. This is not over until absolute and unconditional compliance is guaranteed and delivered. Until then, we remain on alert. Let us also be clear about one further thing. Without our preparedness to use force, Saddam Hussein would not be climbing down at all. Yesterday, I had given the authorization for British forces to be used in action against Saddam Hussein. I will not hesitate to do so again should the circumstances warrant it. There will be no further warning whatsoever. During the crisis, the UN inspectors were withdrawn to Bahrain. Britain and the United States want the Security Council, which is meeting tonight, to order them back to test Iraq's sincerity. Since we arrived, we're on 24 hours' notice to, to go back. We maintain that state of readiness. People are keen to go back, finish the job that they were tasked to do. Short-term, RAF tornadoes remain ready in Kuwait. In the long term, the Allies are tiring of these repetitive crises. President Clinton tonight formally set a goal of deposing Saddam Hussein and installing a new government in Iraq. Brian Hanrahan, BBC News. Iraq's Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz says his government didn't back down because of the threat of airstrikes. Baghdad newspapers are describing Saddam's decision to allow weapons inspectors back in as a victory for Iraq. 
The inspectors are on standby to return tomorrow. There's relief all round. A devastating aerial strike by the United States and Britain looks like it has been avoided, and it's time to celebrate. Few people in Iraq know just how close they came, but the joyous atmosphere here still hasn't dampened the Iraqi anger at the American-led forces which continue to be stationed in the region. Iraq's Vice President Taha Yassim Ramadan says Baghdad will remain proud despite the games of the enemy. UN staff are looking forward to getting back to normal. They've no doubt that it is the Secretary General who is the key to the settlement. First to our Secretary General and to our local Secretary General. His representative in Baghdad believes that the deal has enhanced Kofi Annan's stature. The Secretary General is a man of peace. He has as the head of the United Nations, uh, under the Charter, a responsibility to do everything, to strive for avoiding military conflict or avoiding the use of force that could lead to large suffering and even problems in the region. Celebrating more than a thousand years of civilization in Baghdad, Iraq's police force took the leading role in entertaining the crowd. In a militarized society like Iraq's, this is relative normality. People here think the crisis is over, but the Western forces are not moving from the Gulf, and Iraqis continue to believe that this is just the latest chapter in their long-running fight with the international community. Richard Downs, BBC News, Baghdad. Other news now. A man has died after a 30-ton crane collapsed in the car park of the Royal Liverpool Hospital on Merseyside. The crane was being used to install telephone equipment on the hospital's 12th floor when a section fell onto the 37-year-old man who suffered fatal crash injuries. The British aid worker Sally Becker, known as the Angel of Mostar, has been shot and wounded. The Foreign Office said she'd been hit in the thigh in the northern Albanian town of Bajram Kuri. The Siamese twins, separated yesterday at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital, are still in a critical but stable condition. The four-day-old baby girl spent a peaceful day, but doctors say it's still too early to predict their chances of survival. When they were born on Thursday, the girls were joined at the chest and shared a liver. The Ministry of Defence has denied that it plans to privatise the Royal Squadron, which provides air transport for ministers and members of the royal family. For decades, the RAF has flown members of the royal family and senior politicians on official duties. A royal squadron plane was used to bring Princess Diana's body back to Britain. The royal household pays £13.4 million for the flights and is open to ways of cutting costs. But the palace wasn't warned of the advert in the aviation press, stating that the Ministry of Defence is considering options for royal and VIP air transport in terms of the way the aircraft, the service and the maintenance is provided. I'm amazed on two grounds. Firstly, that we find out from an advertisement in Flight International magazine and not in an announcement from the government. It seems as though they are slightly embarrassed about this and trying to sneak it out the back door. But secondly, I think there's a really serious security consideration involved. We're talking about flying the Queen, the Prime Minister, senior members of the government and the royal family around. And that should be a core activity of the RAF. Some politicians are said to find the ageing planes cramped, but the Defence Secretary claims the call for private tenders is a palace idea. If the royal family want uh, to see whether there are better and cheaper, uh, more cost-efficient ways of doing it, they're entitled to do it. Um, that is why the market is being tested. There is no more significance in it than that. Commercial companies have a week to express interest in tendering for the Royal Squadron's work. A final decision will be made next spring. The MOD says nothing is ruled in or out. Wesley Kerr, BBC News. started tonight with the launch of the world's first digital broadcast via ordinary rooftop aerials. Three, two, one, we're on! The new service will allow viewers to watch extra channels simply by buying a new set-top box, but it's feared there aren't enough boxes to meet the expected demand. Football and Coventry beat Everton 3-0 in the day's only Premiership match. Steve Froggart opened the scoring after a quarter of an hour with a spectacular 30-yard strike. Darren Huckabee added a second before Noel Whelan sealed Coventry's win with a minute of the game left. 
The result means Everton drop one place to fourth from bottom. Coventry moved two places above them. And the main news again tonight. Military action against Iraq has been suspended after Baghdad agreed to the unconditional return of UN weapons inspectors. That's it. That's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. Good night. Hello, good evening to you. If you're thinking of putting the cat out for the night, then have a heart, because it really is going to be quite a chilly night. A widespread frost away from the coast. Lowest temperatures, probably minus three in Northern Ireland, down to between minus five, even as low as minus six in the borders of Scotland in the far north of England. We still have some showers running down the North Sea and across northern and eastern parts of Scotland. Some coming down the Irish Sea, they'll largely die away. We'll keep the showers for eastern parts of Scotland, eastern England, right on the coast there. But inland, some mist, even thicker fog developing in northern Northern Ireland across parts of Scotland and we keep an area of high pressure over us for much of tomorrow so it will be a fine day but a chilly day after that early mist and frost has cleared some sunshine to enjoy but always a thicker cloud getting into the west and probably bringing some rain into Northern Ireland after midnight through tomorrow night and tomorrow night will be quite cold as well best temperatures during the day nines and tens in the south five in Northern Ireland and around freezing across the highlands of Scotland but basically a nice day after a cold night tonight bye for now <laughs>